Thanks for coming to what I think is one of the last talks. Um, I'm Matej Zaharia. I'm a grad student here finishing my PhD now. And uh, I'll talk about uh, big data processing with MapReduce and Spark, which are uh, basically programming models for running data-intensive computation on large clusters. MapReduce is a model that came out of Google and is now widely used everywhere else. Spark is actually an extension of MapReduce that was developed here at Berkeley. Um, and it's something that I'm working on and quite a few other people in the AMP lab, which is the big data lab over here, um, are involved in. So here's what I'll talk about. Basically, I'll start about what, what is the big data problem, and then I'll cover the MapReduce model, as well as Hadoop, which is an open source implementation of MapReduce that's the most widely used one out there today. And so this will be about half the talk. Um, after that, I'm going to talk about limitations of it. So, you know, even though MapReduce is very powerful, there are certain things it doesn't do very well, and that's kind of uh, spurred our own research into Spark. So I'll, I'll present the Spark model as well. And finally, I'll cover some resources for learning both of these things. So let's just start with that. So basically, the big data problem, I'm sure people have seen this before, is that in a lot of domains, including both scientific domains and industry, data is just going much faster than the, the speed at which we can uh, compute on it with, with the traditional techniques. And it's caused by a few different trends. One of them is that we have data sources that are growing quickly, uh, certainly things like the web or mobile computing, but also scientific instruments, things like telescopes or gene sequencing machines are producing data at a rate uh, that goes faster than Moore's law. Um, the second trend is that we have very cheap storage, so disk capacity is, is growing, uh, you know, is doubling every 18 months, and it's very cheap to store all this data, so everyone does that. And then you're left with the stalling CPU speeds, and you, you have to process all this data that you've stored. So just as some examples of, you know, some, some large data sets, uh, Facebook collect logs about things that happen on the website, uh, you know, for, for different reasons, like optimizing the product, and they collect about 60 terabytes uh, per day. Uh, the 1000 Genomes Project is 2000, uh, uh, sorry, 200 terabytes of data, and Google's web index, you know, last time they talked about it, was over 10 petabytes of data. And if you just look at the cost-benefit of these things, you know, it seems like a lot of data compared to what you have on your laptop or something like that, but storing all this data is actually extremely extremely cheap. So the cost of a terabyte disk today for just a typical consumer like you and me is about $50. For these companies, it can easily be, you know, two or three times smaller. And so, for example, if you're Facebook and you have all this information about what's going on that you could use to optimize the project, you know, it's, it's not that much money per day to actually store all of it. So they're all doing that. Uh, but on the flip side, the time to actually compute on this, if you put uh, you know, one terabyte on just one disk, even reading it from the disk would take about six hours because disks can only read at, you know, about 50 megabytes per second. So basically the problem is that a single machine can no longer process or even store all this data, and so we have to distribute it over larger and larger clusters. And as a result, you get things like this. This is, you know, one, one of Google's data centers. Uh, they have tens of thousands of machines in each one. They just buy extremely cheap machines with lots of disks, and they put all this data in there and process it. So the question then is, how, how do we actually program this thing? So in most of this course, you've probably seen this more traditional form of network programming, which is based on message passing between nodes. That's what MPI lets you do. And that's a really natural way uh, to do this, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to do at large scale. It's difficult for three reasons. One of them is that you have to split the problems across nodes. So you have to consider the shape of the network, which nodes are close to each other, as well as data locality, where, each, where, where is each piece of data on disk? Because if you can avoid sending it over the network, that, that, will, be, uh, you know, that, that will be a lot faster. The second problem you have is dealing with failures. So uh, in, in these you know, industry environments, people are not focused on getting highly reliable nodes. Instead, they get lots of cheap nodes, and they just let them fail uh, without going out and stopping the computation and replacing them. And the more machines you have, the higher the chance that you'll see a failure during, say, each hour of computation. 
So just as an example, a commodity server today might be expected to fail once every three years. So the mean time to failure is three years. So that's pretty good. But if you put 10,000 of them together in a room, you have to multiply that rate by 10,000, and you start getting you know, 10 failures per day. And all of a sudden, it means your application has to deal with this. And then the final thing that becomes an issue, especially with these commodity nodes, is stragglers. You might have a node that hasn't outright failed, but it's simply going slowly. This is especially likely to happen if you have, say, a disk that's dying. And then if you have a highly parallel job, as we saw in the last talk, you know, if one of the nodes is slow and everyone is waiting on that to finish, it's not going to be very efficient. So because of these things, this kind of message passing programming is actually very rarely used in these large data processing clusters. Instead, the kinds of models that have become popular are called data parallel models. And the idea there is that we'll restrict the, the programming interface. So it's not just, you know, node one sends a message to node two uh, and you control every message sent. Uh, instead, you, you let the system do more scheduling and, and computation placement for you automatically. And data parallel means that you give the model an operation and a data set to run it on, and it handles actually scheduling the operation, calling it on every item of the data. So it's fine if, if, uh, you know, if the system figures out how to place it for you based on the network topology. Uh, in fact, it's actually fine if you know, it tries running it on one node and then that node fails and it tries running it somewhere else. And the biggest example of this is Google's MapReduce. So MapReduce was the first really widely popular data parallel model, and it was actually published as a research paper by Google in 2004. Uh, today, they say it processes more than 20 petabytes of data per day across their, uh, you know, their data centers. But it really became popular thanks to this open source project called Hadoop, which was really um, started at Yahoo. So Yahoo decided, you know, we'll implement MapReduce, but we'll actually make it free for anyone else to use. And uh, at Yahoo, I think this is running on over 40,000 nodes now. It's also running at Facebook to manage their data warehouse. And it's running at essentially every large internet company that isn't Google or Microsoft. They're all using this open source project. So here's how the MapReduce model works. Uh, it's pretty simple. There are basically two data parallel operations, map and reduce. And these operations work on key value records. So in, in your data files, you have you know, elements that have a key and, and a value. All your data has to look like that. And the key and value can be any type. So the map function is a function where you give it one input key, an input value, and it can produce a list of zero or more intermediate keys and values just from that one element. So you could use that, for example, you know, if you have a, a line of text to split that line of text into words or something like that. Then the reduce function lets you merge data across keys. It gets a key and a list of values from these intermediate ones, and it gets to look at all the values and produce output records with, again, a key and value in each one. So let's just see what, um, what this looks like. So this is one so, sort of the hello world example of MapReduce. It's if we have a big um, uh, text file and we want to do word count. So count how many times each word occurs in the file. So here's how we do it. In our map function, let's say each record is a line of text. We would take the line of text, split it into words, and then produce a key value record with the word as the key and one as the value. So we're just doing that locally on each one. Then in our reduce function, we're going to take the values for each uh, key and combine them, just sum up all those ones. And that's going to give us the final count. That's how it looks. Um, this, is how, uh, this is how it will actually run on a cluster. So basically what we have is there'll be the, the input file over here. It will be split into pieces that different nodes can handle. And then each node will run a map function on it that, that does the local counting. Um, after that, uh, the, the map functions actually write the output to disk on each machine uh, so that it's, it's reliable there in case uh, you know, some, some nodes need to fetch it later. And after it launches the maps, um, MapReduce will launch the reduce tasks. And these guys will each get, each reduce task gets a, a, a fraction of the, um, of the keys, basically. So you take a, a hash function and you just take, you hash each key to a unique reduce task. And uh, so this first reduce task, for example, got the words brown, fox, you know, how, now, and the. 
and it asks it all it asks all the mappers about their values with those keys and then the reduce task at the bottom got these other words and again it talks to all the the mappers about that and finally these apply the reduce function and return yeah Yeah, so, so there are some Python wrappers for Hadoop that look a little bit like what I showed there. There's a bit more code. Yeah, um, I actually, I'll mention one of these later on, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and definitely feel free to ask if, if there are more questions throughout, yeah. Okay, so, so this is how it runs. You know, it's pretty simple, but it lets you do these kind of statistical operations where you do some work on each record, and then you combine the results. So apart from just, just running this, MapReduce does a, a few other things for you automatically. So it automatically decides how to split up the work into tasks. You don't have to worry about, oh, how do I choose the level of parallelism. Um, it sends the task to nodes based on the data locality. So if this file here was in a distributed file system and you know this chunk of the file was only available on node one, it would launch that map task on node one to avoid moving the data around. And it also dynamically load balances the work as tasks finish. So when a node finishes its current task, it asks the master, hey, can you give me a new one? And we can schedule a task that maybe before we weren't planning to do on that node. So that happens just, just for you. The second thing that happens automatically is fault recovery. So if any of your tasks crashes, MapReduce will automatically try it on another node. And the model is set up so that uh, it's easy to do this for both map and reduce tasks. So for the map tasks, it, they, they don't have any dependencies. They just need to read the input data. So it's OK to just rerun it somewhere else. And for the reduce tasks, the maps make sure to save the output locally before sending it on to the reducer so that if you get another copy of that reduce task later, it can fetch the old output. So both of them can be rerun efficiently on another node. Now, one important note about this is for the fault tolerance to work, your user code has to be deterministic. So if your map task is, say, generating a random number or something like that, you, you should make sure that you see that in a deterministic way so that it can produce the same answer on failure. So this is a, you know, one thing you have to deal with. But if you have that property, then this will work even if nodes go away during your job. So, so if, if, if a task crashes, basically we just do on the task. If a node crashes, uh, MapReduce knows all the tasks that it ran on it, and it, it uh, launches them on other nodes, so it can deal with this case as well, and it, it will actually do them in parallel on, on the remaining nodes, so it can recover pretty quickly. Um, and similarly, when a, uh, when a node crashes, we lose those map output files I mentioned, and MapReduce rescheduled the missing map tasks as well, so that reduced tasks can continue fetching the data. Um, and finally, when a task is going slowly, this is the straggler problem I mentioned before, MapReduce automatically detects that and launches a second copy of the task on another node. And at this point, the two copies sort of race to finish. So whichever one finishes first is the one whose output we take, and we just stop the other one. So this is, again, a cool thing that you know, would be pretty hard to program by hand, but the framework will do it automatically. So that's, that's how it works. Um, I want to show a few other example applications just so you get an idea of the things you can do with it uh, because it's not just counting words in, in a file. So uh, I'm just going to show a few short ones. Um, so one uh, really simple thing you can use it for is search, just finding all the records in, in uh, you know, your data set that match a given pattern. And basically the idea here is, um, let's say your input is these line number and line records. That's what Hadoop, for example, gives you when you give it a text file. The idea is in your map function, you output each line only if it matches the pattern. And then in your reduce function, you can just use the identity function. You don't care about the key. Maybe you give them all the same key. And you've, you've collected all the records that match the pattern. So that's an easy way to do a distributed search across a bunch of files. Um, another easy thing to do is uh, sorting. In sorting, say you have a, a bunch of key value records, you want to output the same records sorted by key. Um, so you can actually do this just by using the, the partitioning that MapReduce already does without having to write any code. So your map and reduce can be identity functions, but then you pick the, the partitioning function across nodes so that uh, keys, you know, when a, if you have, uh, uh, you know, keys in your data set, uh, contiguous ranges of keys get mapped to each partition. So it, it needs to be order preserving. 
So just as an example, you know, if we had this data set that maybe these guys had words like ant and bee and zebra, we could pick our partitioning functions to say, okay, keys from A to M go to reduce number one, keys from N to Z go to reduce number two, and then automatically the data will be split into these two pieces. And in most MapReduce implementations, including Hadoop, you can configure it to sort the data in each piece as well. So just the output data will already be sorted by key, and you know, you've just sorted your, your big data set. Um, and, uh, Final thing I, um, you know, you can do that's pretty common is building an inverted index. So this is, you know, a simplified version of building, say, the Google Web Index. The idea here is you have uh, documents. Maybe the documents are a file name and all the text in this file, like for a web page. And you want a list of files that contain each word so that when someone looks up a word, you can quickly find it. And the way you can do this is... In your map function, you take the text, you split it into words, and you output a record for each word with, with the file name as the value. And then in the reduce function, you've gotten a word and a bunch of file names. You just take the unique file names for each word. And so this will automatically, you know, you'll, you'll end up with the list of all the files that contained each word across the whole data set. So that's, that's kind of what this looks like. So we have, you know, two files here, uh, Hamlet and, and Twelfth Night. They have a bunch of phrases in them. We take each word out of it as a key, and as a value, we put the file name. And then when we combine these guys, for, for each word, we get the complete list of files. So like B, for example, occurred in both places, so we get both of them. Maybe afraid was only in this one. So that's, that's how it works. And the final thing to know about MapReduce is, even though you get these little individual steps, uh, you can also get quite a bit done by combining multiple MapReduce steps. So let's say, for example, we wanted to do something a little bit fancier than the inverted index. Uh, say instead we wanted the 100 most popular words. So it's hard to actually do this in one MapReduce job because you need to count the words and then you need to sort the results as well. But you can do it with two stages. So for example, in um, job one, you can create an inverted index. Now you have a word and a list of files. And then in job two, you can map, you can take each word, the list, turn this into uh, the key and leave the word as the value. And then you can sort these guys using the sorting function I mentioned before. And now your result is, is a sort list of, uh, you know, words sorted by their count. So this is how you'll see a lot of, like, non-trivial MapReduce applications need multiple stages, and this is how they're built up. Okay. So the final thing I want to cover with MapReduce is a little mini introduction to the Hadoop package. Uh, so Hadoop is, as I said, is the most widely used implementation of it. It's open source. It's free to use. Um, it's also actually really easy to run on Amazon uh, Compute um, uh, Cloud if, if you want uh, to do that. They have a service specifically for running Hadoop jobs. Um, if you want to, to play with it, you can get it from hadoop.apache.org, and all you need on your laptop is, is Java, and you can actually run it locally to develop applications. And there are three ways to write jobs. Um, there's a Java API, which is the, the kind of native one where you write map and reduce functions. There's something called Hadoop streaming. The idea in this one is you'll write uh, Python or Perl scripts as your uh, map and reduce functions. And you'll tell Hadoop, just launch this Python script and give it all the records on the standard input stream. And it's going to read them and, and write the values to standard out. So it's a very easy way to, uh, to program these things in Python. And that's called Hadoop Streaming. And then there's a C++ API called Pipes. Um, I'm just going to show the, the Java one just to give you a very quick sense of what it looks like. Um, although they're, they're all, you know, they're, they're all like fairly approachable to try out. Um, so this is going to be the word count example in Java. And essentially, the way the Java one works is you write a mapper class for your map function and a reducer class. And then you write a program that hooks these together into a job. So this class, you know, it has a bunch of stuff going on in it, but the main point is you have a class that uh, implements this mapper interface, and uh, you, you implement a map function in it. And you get all these types here, which are Hadoop's data types for, say, long integers or text, as well as this output collector that you put data in. 
So there's a bunch of boilerplate around it, but the actual body of the map function is this. And here it looks you know, a lot like the Python thing we had before, where basically you take your value, you split it, you turn it into a string, you split it into tokens, and you output a, a key value record for, you know, for each word. So once you write the boilerplate, that's, that's all there is. Um, reduce function is very similar. In the reduce function, you write a class that extends, you know, reducer, and it gets a key and an iterator for all the values in it. So you can iterate over them and, and sum them up or whatever you want to do. And in this case, we're just going to sum them up. So, you know, we, we pull out each value and we add it to this, this number, and then we reduce, we return the number. Okay. And finally, once you write these functions, you hook them up together into a job. And basically, the way you do that is by writing this configuration. So in the configuration, you give your job a name. Um, you tell it, here's the mapper class and the reducer class. There's also something called combiner that lets you reduce data locally on each machine before sending it across the network. So that can, can save some time. Um, and you tell it, okay, here are some input files, and here's where I want the output to go. And then you say, run job on it, and it's going to submit it to a cluster and run it for you. So that's, you know, that, that's sort of what it looks like. So just to summarize this part, essentially the key idea here is to provide this data parallel model where you tell the system, here's the operation I want to do, here's the data set, but you don't tell it exactly how to do it, you know, which nodes will load what and what messages they'll send to each other. And because of this model, you can get a lot of um, things that are usually hard happening for you automatically, including dividing the work into tasks, locality-based uh, scheduling, and uh, fault recovery. So that's, that's kind of what these things do. Uh, but, you know, even, even though this, this stuff is very useful, uh, the story doesn't actually end here. So I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what can be problems with this and what sort of uh, other tools are looking like in this space. Yeah. So, like, in Yahoo and Facebook, I heard the other thing is called pick and hide. Yes. So basically, Yeah, that's true, yeah. Oh, good question, yeah. So, yeah, so... It, in general, um, it can be f slightly faster if you write your own, but if you can use these languages on top, for a, you, sh you should probably do it because it's just going to save you a lot of time. So yeah, so Pig and Hive com 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 uh, compile essentially SQL queries, like database queries, to map into steps, and they make it very easy to, to write these kind of SQL queries. Uh, the, the, the main reason, I, I think most these companies actually mostly use these languages for simple things, but it's hard to do more complicated uh, analytics in those. So that's when they fall back to Java or Python uh, to, to actually write more complex functions. So it depends what you want to do. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, so I'll talk, so, so I'll talk a bit about the limitations um, of MapReduce, and I'll talk about Spark, which is our project here. There are quite a few other projects in this space that, that do similar things, but hopefully this gives you an idea. Um, of, of you know, what, what these tools can look like. So essentially, so MapReduce, as I said, is pretty powerful, but it, it has some limitations. And the main limitation is when you start writing more complex applications beyond just the single word count or the inverted index. Um, and the problem there is that you start to write applications that need to combine multiple MapReduce steps. So just as an example, Google's web indexing pipeline was 21 steps when they put out the MapReduce paper. It might be longer now. Um, common analytics queries, like if you want to take some data about users and convert it into sessions, uh, or, or say take the top K words, as we saw before, can be multiple MapReduce steps. And the other thing is if you have iterative algorithms, so a lot of numerical optimization or machine learning algorithms need to make many passes over the data, and that ends up being lots of MapReduce steps. And there are two problems with these. One is programmability, and the other one is performance. So with programmability, when you have these multi-step jobs, you end up with lots of map and reduce functions. In, in Java, you'd have these mapper and reducer classes. You know, in Python, you'd have a bunch of functions sitting throughout the code. And uh, basically, you know, th these are spread out throughout your project. It's kind of hard to follow what goes after what. Um, for each one, you, you may have to write lots of boilerplate code, the configuration code I showed before to actually submit it to the cluster. And then once you have these functions sitting around, it's easy to combine them incorrectly and, you know, have a job that, you know, reads data it wasn't expecting because you put it at the wrong place in the pipeline. So these are kind of usability things. 
Now, another kind of important uh, issue is performance. So MapReduce itself only lets you do one pass of computation over the data. And if you want to do multiple passes, you have to save the output to a, a file, and say you're in a distributed file system, and then load it again into the next drop in, in between these steps. Now, this is expensive in you know, most of these multi-step applications because they want to be able to use data. So for example, if you have a, an, an algorithm, an iterative algorithm like PageRank, this is something that runs many map and reduce functions over the same data, uh, and it's inefficient to have to read it from a file and write it to a file each time. Uh, or if you, even if you want to do interactive queries, often you'll want to pick a subset of your data and then ask a bunch of questions about it, and you'd like the data sharing between those questions to be fast. So what happens is that users who write these long pipelines often optimize uh, them by hand by, say, merging together multiple map functions or multiple reduce functions to try to minimize the number of steps. So the Spark project, which is you know, one, one uh, open source project developed here, uh, aims to address both of these problems. And uh, it does it in two ways. So to make programming easier, it offers this concise uh, functional API, which basically means you're, you, you get to work with um, collections of objects, and you do parallel transformations on them. And there are a bunch of parallel transformations going beyond just map and reduce, so that things like top K and sorting and so on become very easy. Easy. Uh, the API is also integrated in Python, Java, and Scala. So writing these is similar to just writing a function in, in one of these languages and just saying, run it on my distributed data set. Um, for the performance side, Spark takes into account that your application will likely have multiple steps, and it provides two things. One is in-memory data sharing. You can tell it to keep the data in memory on the nodes between steps, which is much faster than sharing through the file system. And the second one is it knows how to optimize across multiple operators and come up with a good plan so you don't have to optimize those by hand. So just how, how does that actually look? So on the programmability side, this is the word count in Hadoop that I showed before. This is sort of the whole file to do word count. And you know, it's not horrible. I mean, it's, it's basically about 100 uh, lines of code um, to, to do this word count, but it's still fairly sizable. Um, if you want to do this in Spark, this is the code in Spark. This is using Python. So basically, you know, the code can be significantly shorter because it's designed so that you write functions directly in Python uh, as Lambda expressions that you pass through uh, and, and you pass them through these different operators. So yeah? Is Martin saying that Spark is written in Scala? Have you, have you accomplished Python bindings? Yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. We, so the program, the, the system is written in Scala. We have a little Python wrapper that basically... Uh, uh, runs, it runs Python on each worker node, and it communicates between them through the Spark uh, Scala binaries. So it uses Spark for all the communication and job scheduling and stuff, but whenever, basically, Spark sees like a map function where it's going to talk to Python and tell it, hey, here's a record, you know, run a map on it. They, so it, it's a bit friendlier because Hadoop streaming, uh, the interface between you and Hadoop is always text. Here the interface is Python objects. So we use, we use the pickle library actually. We automatically pickle and unpickle these guys and you, uh, you just get to think of them as Python objects. Um, so just in this example, you know, for example, here we're getting a bunch of strings. Here we're getting a key value pair. Here we're getting integers that we're adding. You don't need to worry about the types. Yeah. So, so it's, it's actually, a, you know, it's a fairly solid um, API around Spark. It's, it, it has pretty much all the features you get in Scala, and it uses the underlying engine for most of the expensive things. Yeah. Okay, so, so this, is, yeah, this is kind of what it looks like. The idea is you just get these operators you can chain together. I'll explain them a bit more later. And then on the performance side, it can also be significantly faster. So these are two of these iterative algorithms, k-means clustering and logistic regression, that make each day make about 10, 20 passes over the data. And running these in Spark can be you know, easily uh, 10, uh, maybe sometimes 100 times faster because you can share the data more efficiently between the steps. So let me just explain briefly what it looks like. So the, the key idea of the model is that you write programs in terms of transformations on distributed data sets. 
Um, so you get to, to build these data sets, apply any transformations you want in them, and also control how they're shared across jobs. And the objects you get are called resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. Um, they're distributed across the cluster, and they're resilient to failure. They automatically get rebuilt if something goes away. So as a programmer, you see these as just collections of objects similar to your array in Python or in Java or in C, um, and they can be stored in memory or disk, and they're spread out across the cluster nodes. You build them with these transformations like map and filter, and the system automatically rebuilds them on failure. So I'll show an example here. I'll go in a little bit more detail. Um, this is an example where you have a log file on the cluster, and maybe you want to search for error messages in the file. Um, so just load those error messages into memory and then search for different patterns. Um, so this is what our cluster will look like. We have a driver node where we're typing in the code and a bunch of workers. Uh, one of the cool things in Spark is that the API I showed can be used at the Python console or at the Scala console as well. So you can use it interactively. You don't have to write a program and then run it. You can actually just open a shell and type in commands. So this is, this is how you uh, you'd do this particular one. So you'd first say, okay, let's make a data set of lines, which is our text file, and I gave it a path here in HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system. You can use other file systems as well. And this is gonna be our base RDD that we're gonna transform. So this is a distributed collection. Um, next, you might do some transformations. So you might say lines.filter, and then this lambda s, s that starts with error is the Python way of writing a function in line. So, you, you know, if you've seen a bit of Python, maybe you've seen this. Uh, the, the other way you can do it is you can just define a function in your program and pass in the function name. Um, and in both cases, the function will automatically be sent to the worker nodes, and they'll go ahead and run it. So this is just the standard Python, you know, starts with function. So this gives us a transformed RDD. It's only the messages that pass the filter, so the ones that are actually errors. Uh, next, we might want to do a map. So for example, maybe these are tab-separated messages, and we want to pull out field number two. You can just write that map function in a lambda and get this out. And uh, finally, we can cache just the data that we wanted to extract from each record. So we're not going to cache the whole file in memory, but we'll keep these guys. So at this point, nothing's actually run on the cluster. Instead, Spark just remembers these operations, and it will come up with an efficient execution plan whenever you tell it to actually create some output. So what we'll do next is we're going to do a, another filter, and we'll do count. We're going to count how many of these error messages contain foo. And count is a special operation called an action. Count has to return back a number, so it, it can no longer be lazy. It has to actually evaluate the stuff you built up before and give you back a number. And when Spark sees this, it's going to come up with a plan to execute the filters and maps before. So it's going to look at where data is laid out on the cluster. It's going to send some tasks to each node uh, to process it. Each task will do both the filter and the map and then the, the last filter. These are automatically fused together into one um, task. Um, and so they're going to do that work and send back some results. And then each node will also build up a cache of the cache data uh, it computed along the way. So these are just these error messages. So next time you run a, que uh, a query on it, maybe foo wasn't the problem, you search for a bar, uh, Spark is going to know that the messages are in the cache. It's going to schedule the task based on that and just read them out of the cache and return the results uh, right away. And of course you can do, you know, not just filters and counts, but you can do a bunch of other operations too. So just as a sense of what you can actually do with this, um, one of the tests we do is full text search over Wikipedia. So this is about 60 gigabytes of data. Uh, and on 20 machines, if you do this with on-disk data uh, or with MapReduce, it takes about 30 seconds to just scan all of it and search for a string of text. If you do it with the in-memory data in Spark, it takes about two seconds. So it can take you know, these even like reasonably large data sets and make them uh, uh, quite a bit more interactive to work with. Um, and then if you have more machines or you know, you're willing to wait longer, it can go faster as well. So for example, we, we did a, a one terabyte of data, a full text search of that in about seven seconds. I think this was on 100 machines. So it's, it's possible to take you know, reasonably large data sets and actually explore them. 
Um, the other thing the model does is fault recovery. So whenever you build one of these data sets, it, ma uh, you know, Spark, much like MapReduce uh, itself, uh, will remember the operations that went into it. So it remembers, okay, when I build these messages, I did a filter and then a map, and it builds this little graph of dependencies between them. And then when a node goes away, uh, for example, say that this node, um, you know, sorry, th this node here went away at the bottom, and we lost cache number two. Um, we would actually take this block and rerun the filter and map on it to build that up again. Okay, so that's you know that's kind of um, enough uh, of me just talking about it. I also want to show you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, demo time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I also want to show you. Uh, a little bit of a demo, just just so you can see what this looks like. Um, so let's go over that there and see if things are actually still working. Um, okay. All right. So so in this demo, I've launched a Spark cluster on Amazon EC2. We actually have a script for this. So if you use EC2, you know it's it's very easy to launch a cluster like this. It takes about five minutes. You just tell it how many nodes you want and how big each node should be. And this is a cluster with 20 nodes. They each have four CPU cores, and you know it has a bunch of memory. And on this cluster, I've loaded this Wikipedia data set that's about 60 gigabytes. So, so we just have it sitting there. Um, so what I'll do next, so this is uh, my, my uh, command prompt that's connected to this cluster. Let me just resize this guy a little bit um, to make it fit here. OK, can you guys see this? Or maybe I'll, should I make it bigger? It's fine. I'll make it slightly. Oh, whatever. Okay, let's just leave it like this. Okay, so, so this is, I, I've launched a Python uh, shell connected to this cluster, uh, and I'm going to run some commands on it. So this is, I just launched basically an IPython shell, if you use IPython, and you can type in your standard Python commands and, and get back values. But in the Spark version of the Python shell, you also get this object called SC, or Spark Context, that lets you do operations in parallel. So what I'm going to do is uh, create a, a text file here. And I have this file, I have this distributed file system set up, and wiki.tsv is this Wikipedia data set. So now, uh, you know, I've, I've created an object to represent that. Um, so as soon as you've created this object, you can actually start looking at it um, right away. Um, so, for example, one of the things you can do is just look at the first item in the data set, see whether that's kind of what you expect. And so this is what the first item looks like. So you can see there's a bunch of uh, basically XML markup in there, some backslashes, a whole bunch of stuff, because this is, this is a string representing that whole Wikipedia article. Uh, to make it a little bit easier... Uh, to look at, I'm going to uh, take just the first 1,000 characters, just so you can see all the fields in it, because it's this tab-separated file. So that's what it looks like. So basically, this file I have contains one line of text for each article in Wikipedia, and each line has five fields. It has an article ID, um, it has the title, and yet, and yet is basically the alphabetically first thing in this data set, so that's why it's the first one. Um, it has a date when it was last modified. Um, it has an XML version of the article, which is what Wikipedia stores internally, and you don't see it, but at the end it has a plain text version as well. You can see it here. So for all that XML, this was actually the plain text, is, and yet, and yet was the third album of whatever. Okay. So let's, let's actually transform this into something that's a bit easier to work with. Uh, so I'm going to create a data set that represents just the, the plain text. And I'm going to do that with a map. Uh, and I'll just write it in line. So we get a line of text called S. Um, I'll split it by tabs. Sorry, that's a bad tab. Uh, OK. And then I'll take the last guy in it, the last element of the array. So again, without having to compute the whole thing, you can pick out the first element and see whether this is what you wanted. So when I do text that first, yeah, it is just a plain text for and yet, and yet. So this is good. So now, you know, now that I've defined this, um, I'm going to want to ask a bunch of queries on it. So I'm going to call uh, cache, sorry, uh, cache uh, on it. And this marks it to be kept in memory the next time we compute it. And then I'm going to just search the whole thing. Uh, so for example, let's say, uh, how, let, let's count how many of these articles. Yeah? Sorry, just, just a quick question. I noticed it's automatically converting the text to Unicode. Does, it, does the Spark um, framework do that automatically, or do you have to specify? 
Yeah, no, the, the Python uh, uh, binding always uses Unicode for the strings. Where the file I'm reading is ISO. It will actually, uh, it will convert it to Unicode. But, I mean, yeah. So yeah, essentially, yeah. Yeah. So it does, it, yeah, it, it basically gets the whatever format it was in and converts it to Unicode. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so now, now we're going to take these guys and let's say for each string, uh, how many strings uh, contain Berkeley? And let's count that. Okay, so now, you know, this is going to scan the whole thing. So when you start that, it's going to launch a bunch of tasks on all these nodes. And the first time you do it, it'll take a while because it doesn't have the data in memory yet. Uh, so you can see it's running, well, it's going, it's running 480 tasks and it's finished, you know, about 200 of them right now. And this is going to use all the nodes in this cluster. So, and uh, you can also see in the messages, if you look really quickly, that it's adding a bunch of stuff in memory and it's saying, okay, I added this many, you know, megabytes in memory on this node. Okay, so, you know, so we ran this, so this is kind of nice. We, you know, we were able to type in a function and it got sent out to all the nodes, but it's not exactly interactive. It still took, you know, took about 28 seconds to scan this whole thing. And the answer was 15,000 articles contain Berkeley. That's hopefully not too bad. So let's try to do this again now that the data is in memory. So you can just launch this guy again. And you can see, you know, once, once you have it in memory, you can actually explore this data quite a bit faster. And the answer is still the same. It's still 15,000. Um, so just, yeah. What happens if your data fit? Yeah, if it doesn't fit in memory, we'll actually keep only the part that fits. And for the rest of it, we'll put it on disk. So it's not, Spark is actually designed to, so that, it, it can work on any size cluster. You don't have to think about how much memory your cluster has. So it will just, uh, you know, it will go slower, but it will still uh, finish. Yeah. In yeah. Case, is it an LRU cache or is it just a block scan? It's an LRU cache, yeah, at least recently used. Yep. So I just had like a big data orgasm looking at that happening, but like, okay. no, because like a lot of times in pig and uh, yeah, yeah. in hive stuff, you can't just see like, you know how you just showed the first, like how the maps and oh, yeah, you got to wait till the thing runs forever and then there's yeah, yeah. some problem, uh -huh. right? That, is this open source? Like when will like, I feel like industry yeah. will just immediately throw away pig and hive and just. Oh yeah, things. no, it, it is, it's fully open source. Actually, I was going to talk about it. It's, you can go to Spark, uh, sorry, project.org. Uh, and it's fully open source. You can download it. It's actually an Apache project now. And uh, yeah, qu quite a few people are actually using it this way and contributing to it. So you, you are very much encouraged to try it out. Thank yeah, you. yeah. How stable is Spark? So Spark has been, I mean, it's, it's been around since 2009. And it's being used in production at uh, a, a number of companies already. So it is fairly stable. I mean, like all software, you know, if you use the newest release, it may have some bugs. But, but a bunch of people are using it. Yeah. OK, cool. So yeah, so let me just show a couple of other things you can do. So this was, we searched for Berkeley. There were 15,000 of these articles. Let's try to search for something else also. Uh, so let's just write in this guy is what we'll search for. And we'll search for this. So, so one of the cool things I'm doing here, uh, apart from, from making fun of Stanford, is I'm also using a variable that I defined in the shell inside my query. So Spark will automatically capture that and send it along with the function. So again, Berkeley was 15,000. This guy, when we run it, it's only 13,000. So that's, that's one, you know, one thing we find. Uh, well, there is, actually, if you look on the map, yeah. But, but no, it's not, I mean, most of these articles are not about the universities. They're just people named that. Yeah, and then the final thing I want to show is, um, is you can also use functions. So or let's call it like has Berkeley. So it's kind of hard to type looking at this. So for example, say I wanted to write a function to check whether a string contains this. Uh, I could do that. And now, if I want to search for this, instead of putting a lambda, I can just put in this function. And you get the same thing. So yeah, so it's designed, so it's designed to make it very quick to experiment with data, uh, to, to build up you know, little data structures, intermediate data, and search through them. And then you can take all this stuff and do it in a standalone program, too. You don't have to just do it in the shell. So that's, that's going to conclude the demo. Um, Okay, so 
just to, to give you a bit more of a sense of what, what this can do, I'll show a few of the other operations available, and then I'll talk a little bit about just how, how to get uh, started using all this stuff. So in, in Spark, you get your map and reduce operations. I can map reduce, but you also get a whole bunch of other ones. Um, so for example, um, one thing you can do that's actually really useful for learning it is you can take a local uh, data set and spread it out across the cluster, turn it into a parallel one. You don't have to worry about writing it to a file or anything like that. Um, you can just take a local you know, array of, of objects and do that with the parallelize operation. Um, you can do map, we covered that, so map is just pass each element through a function. Uh, filter, we also covered, you pass each element through a function that returns a boolean, and you get stuff back. And then uh, maybe you saw in the word count example, flat map. So flat map is you map one object to many other, to, to a list of zero or more other objects. And it's called that way because that's what it's, it's called in, uh, in Scala, which is the language we started in. Um, but it's like mapping one object to, to multiple ones. Um, so in this case, for example, we have the numbers one, two, three, and we map each one to the range of numbers from zero to that guy, uh, you know, minus one. So this, if you're not familiar with Python, range of zero x is the numbers zero, one, two, up to x minus one. And so this allows us to expand our data set. You know, the one gets mapped to just zero, the two gets mapped to zero, one, and the three gets mapped to one, two, three. Okay. Um, in terms of actions, I mostly showed doing stuff with count. Um, you can also do a few other things. So you can do collect, which is just give me back. It's the opposite of parallelize. It's give me back the distributed uh, data set as a local collection. You can do take to take the first few elements uh, in addition, instead of just the first one. Um, you can do reduce, which is I give you a function to merge two objects, and you use it to merge all the objects together with this associative function. And you can also do save, which is write this data set out to a file, and we support the Hadoop uh, file system for that. And finally, you get these special operations for key value pairs. So if you make a data set with key value pairs, which are just these tuples in, um, in, in Python, um, you can get, uh, for example, uh, reduce by key, which is similar to map reduce as reduce, where you give it a function to merge two values, and it does that separately for each key, and it does it in parallel across multiple nodes. Um, you can do group by key, which is just give me the values for it, uh, if you wanted to do something other than merging them, or you can do sort by key. So our philosophy here is that we, we provide, actually, we provide probably over uh, uh, 20 f different operators uh, out of the box for you to make it easy to write these pipelines together. And then the final thing the model does is, given a bunch of these operators, it also fuses them together into an efficient way to execute it. So unlike MapReduce, which just looks at each map and reduce step, this will look at the whole job and come up with a, an optimized plan across the whole thing. Um, so it supports these general graphs. It will automatically pipeline functions. So for example, if you do a map followed by another map, uh, which looks a little bit like this, or even like what I had in the demo, it automatically fuses those into one function so, so that they can be executed together. And it also is aware of data locality and of partitioning. So in this example, I do a group by, so this data is now hashed by the key because we did a, a distributed group by, and then I do a join, which is bring together objects with the same key, and it knows these are already hashed, so it doesn't have to reshuffle them. Yeah? So how much of this was, uh, was original code and how much of it was like open source code? Really yeah. Yeah, so we, yeah, good question. So we, we wrote the whole um, engine from scratch. So we wrote our own um, execution engine. We're not using the, the Hadoop engine underneath and compiling this down to it. And uh, the, the main reason is because we wanted the whole thing to be low latency. So we wanted to be able to do our job in like, you know, 1.5 seconds as I showed, which, which the existing Hadoop engine wasn't designed for. It's, it's great if you have, you know, huge like, uh, you know, like a multi-hour job that's going to run on a thousand node cluster. That's great but it's not really for like the one second long job. Yeah, but it does very similar things to what these other languages do. It's not, uh, you know, we didn't necessarily um, innovate on this, but we just wanted to make it easy to use. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so this is what it does. And finally, apart from using it in Python, you can also use it in Scala and Java. Scala, if you're not familiar, is this kind of higher level language on the Java VM. It's actually a really cool language. It's very fun to learn and um, it's very, it's, it's both 
uh, pretty fast as far as these things go and, and very concise. So, uh, you know, we, we've had lots of fun using it. Uh, and in Java, you don't get, unfortunately, you don't get the equivalent of lambdas. This is like the Scala equivalent of a lambda. So you have to write these inner classes. But we've still tried to make it pretty concise so that it's easier to, to build these up uh, than, than with MapReduce. And uh, the, the project is open source. We have, we're, we're very fortunate to have a really quickly growing community. So we have a, a, a meetup in the Bay Area every month where we have over 1,000 members signed up for it. Uh, we have over 60 developers who have contributed code to the project. Most contributors are from outside UC Berkeley. There are maybe you know, 15 people at UC Berkeley working on uh, this project now. Um, and we have 18 different companies who have contributed code. So this is really... Uh, uh, you know, in, in the past year especially, uh, it's, it's really kind of taken off as a, as a thing that people are using in industry, and we've been f very fortunate to have these guys working on it. They're contributing back really non-trivial um, sort of functionality. Uh, so you can, you can find out more about it um, on, on the website. Um, so just to finish up, so, so what can you do, you know, if you want to learn this? Uh, we have quite a few resources, and we definitely encourage you to try it out. You know, let us know if it works or doesn't work for, for your applications. Um, you can go to sparkproject.org, the homepage, where you can see some, some video tutorials, as well as uh, these hands-on exercises you can try on Amazon, where you actually spin up a cluster and do some queries on it. Um, you can run it in local mode on your laptop. It's pretty easy. Uh, or on local clusters or with these scripts to deploy it to Amazon EC2. And we're also holding a training camp for it similar to the Sparlab boot camp next week. Now, the camp is actually, uh, you know, the, you can't register for it anymore, but there will be a free video stream. So you can check out ampcamp.berkeley.edu if you want to learn this. And there'll be exercises you can try on EC2 as well. So that's, that's what I wanted to cover. Basically, in this space of big data processing, you have to deal with these commodity clusters. They have uh, some significant challenges like faults and stragglers and data placement, and data parallel models are trying to handle these automatically. And things like uh, MapReduce and Spark and probably future uh, data programming, uh, future parallel models uh, following this make it quite a bit easier to program these jobs if that's what you want to do. So you can learn more about these things online. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, cool. Yeah, well, definitely, you know, if you try it out, you can also contact me. Let me know how it goes. So now we have another half an hour break when uh, the applications people will come and